I just want to give a start this off with a quick correction to something we were talking about yesterday. It was deeper in the episode. It was about Pizza Hut and Wendy's. I don't know if you recall that conversation. We were kind of uh, bantering about as if the entire brand of Pizza Hut or Wendy's were filing for bankruptcy. It's actually just a really powerful and large franchisee. And, and, and my brain somehow skipped that word in the headline. It, also, just because it's, it's hard to imagine an individual franchisee owning this number of stores. Mm. So the company NPC International is the operator of 1,200 Pizza Huts and 400 Wendy's restaurants. And they're filing for bankruptcy. So it's still obviously a massive impact for either of those brands. But that's why the numbers kind of messed me up when I was, I was like, wait a second, there's more than 400 Wendy's, I was saying in the clip. Yeah. And there's certainly more than 1,200 Pizza Huts. But this is their biggest individual franchisee. In other words, their biggest independent owner of a number of stores. So if you go watch that segment, then just, I'm just reframing it or admitting that we kind of talked about it in the wrong way. Uh, nonetheless, it could end up being a problem for both of those brands if this particular franchisee goes under they take all those stores with them although still it sounds like they're going to figure it out through the restructuring right. all right so that's number one number two i want to mention our first sponsor here on this show well believe it or not hmm. and it's a sponsor that i'm wearing right now you see this wonderfully fit high quality garment that is gracing my body here mm -hmm. uh this is a built t-shirt if you follow on box therapy you may have heard of this brand if you've looked at me in a video in the last God knows how many videos, you've seen me wearing built clothing. I like the fact that they have different blend options for their various models of t-shirts. I wear t-shirts. I wear plain clothes. I wear basics. I love it. I don't even think about it in the morning, Will. I just grab. I just go to the drawer and I know what I'm going to do. Mm. And these, these shirts, uh, they're comfortable because they have a little stretch to them. And I like a little stretch. I don't like feeling like I'm constricted in there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is a large that I'm wearing. If you're, uh, I'm six feet tall, around 185 pounds. It's like, it's a perfect thing. Go check out their website. We have a code. It's not just t-shirts they do. I wear their long sleeves. I wear their hoodies. It's a whole, they got underwear now. I think they're even selling masks, which is, that's the topical thing. Uh, for people to be doing at the moment you throw one of those into your order so i have a link in the description of this video and also a code so you can save i think it's 22 percent something like that unbox Very summer specific. unbox summer you gotta type in unbox summer i'll put that in the description also and see what the discount is but i think it's around 22 percent so you can save some cash and upgrade your basics upgrade your essentials the things in the drawer that you reach for the most. And I can speak to the long-term durability as well because this thing's been through, these things go through the wash and they still look the same, which mm. for a black t-shirt, believe it or not, is difficult. Mm. I've been through black t-shirts in my life. Yeah, they tend to fade. They fade out and they start to look ugly. This one lasts a little bit longer. So anyway, go check that out. All right, Galaxy Note 20 Ultra seemingly leaked on Samsung's own website. Uh, intentional or what? What's going on here? Probably not. It's on the Ru Russian website, and the speculation at the moment, at least uh, via Circuit Breaker and other places, is that maybe the uh, web designer or the person doing the layout for these particular web pages may have grabbed the wrong a uh, assets. Mm. And the reason that's the speculation is because you're clicking on something on the site that's supposed to take you to Note 10 stuff. Let me just get this right. The Verge has confirmed that the images do currently appear on Samsung's Russian website for the Galaxy Note 8 as the background for a section that reads, discover the next generation Note, which links out to the Galaxy Note 10, which of course is not a new phone. And then, then you see this instead. You see, well, what looks like the next gen, and it's also in the copper color, which if you're following Mr. Ice Universe, he had suggested that that was going to be the color we were going to see on the ultra model of the upcoming Note series. So, and a huge camera camera cutout that also looks like the it, it's the whole rumored thing on a Samsung branded site, which happens to be in Russia. But man, you got to feel pretty confident at this moment, don't you, Will? 
Yeah. So it's not only the color, it's actually the real look. Yeah, that device. would appear to be the case. Yeah. You got the pen laying on top. And I have to say, as far as the look's concerned, it's a, I'm kind of into it. It's a pretty nice looking phone. And so obviously the camera module reminiscent of the S20 Ultra in shape and, and scale, and also in the fact that it appears to have one of those folded zoom lenses. The bottom lens has a different appearance to it on the image that you're hovering over right now. What do you think about this copper color? Um, it's not for me, but uh, I can see some people rocking it. Yeah, a lot of it's a uh, we're in a really weird stage in smartphones where you have to come with some. It's got to be some a color. I don't know. It's got to be some a flashy color. It started when Apple started to work on the uh, rose gold. Mm. And it was like, what is that? Is it gold? Is it a, a, plain, a pink or blush? Or, uh, and then now we have this copper. But I think for a certain segment, that could be a hot color. Mm -hmm. For a certain, But you're right. Uh, if a guy like me, a guy like you, maybe we don't go for it. And I'm sure it'll be available in other colors. Note 20 Ultra, you know it's going to be a heavy hitter from a spec perspective. And now we have our first glimpse into what it's actually going to look like. Exciting times. Uh, it's going to be pricey, let's be honest. Hmm. If the uh, S20 Ultra was any indication, uh, you got to think this thing's going to be over a thousand bucks. You're looking at eleven, twelve hundred bucks. Yes. Holy moly. We have some news regarding the iPhone production in India. We talked two episodes ago about TikTok getting banned in India. Hmm. And I, I mean, I saw the Indian fans come out in the comments. Uh, I saw all kinds of activity and I was reading. I was in there because I'm curious. I'm genuinely curious. I'm approaching this from a curious perspective. I don't know everything. I'm not on the ground there. I'm not immersed in the culture. I try to be. I try to stay up on it, but there's limitations to that. So that's why at, in that particular episode, I said, you tell me what you're seeing down there. And the commenters came in and they said, uh, a lot of them said, look, well, I understand where you're going, Lou, with the political component and obviously what took place at the border region there, uh, the violence and, and the rest of it. But the actually, the official statement coming from the Indian government is that these apps, the apps that were banned, the 59 apps, uh, TikTok and others, it was, they had more specifics about certain uh, data uh, breaches and and kind of uh, uh, the potential, it kind of similar to the to the Huawei thing. Like, where where is the data going uh, where's the privacy, your usual conversation around how a piece of software is treating your privacy. Mm -hmm. That was the official line on it. But this story today kind of takes it in a hardware direction as well. And so it brings into question, once again, the political landscape, the atmosphere in the air relating to Chinese in Indian relations. Mm. And so uh, iPhone assembly in India badly disrupted as Chinese border dispute worsens. Well, that's the headline on 9to5Mac. Uh, this has to do with the parts coming into India because as we've spoken about many times here, India making a push to do at least, well, a fairly significant portion of the assembly of the smartphones that would be sold domestically regardless of the brand. Whether it be Samsung, whether it be Apple, <laughs> There are incentives in place to encourage some percentage of the work being done on those devices to happen domestically. However, you're going to need to get parts from elsewhere, Will. You're going to need to get parts from China, I'll tell you what. Mm -hmm. You're going to be making a smartphone right now, even if you're Apple. However, given this, the current state of things, it appears that there is increased scrutiny being applied based on whatever evidence exists within the Indian government there's extra scrutiny being applied to those goods that are trying to pass that border to get into that assembly plant so that the assembly can be made. And so that's apparently throwing some sort of a wrench into the speed at which the manufacturing process, assembly process can take place, and then those phones can make it to that domestic market. Now, the player in question is Foxconn, obviously. They moved a certain uh, number of of a certain amount of their production into India to, to serve this particular need. And they would love to get their hands on the goods they need faster. At this point, the article states that 
the government officials at the border are actually inspecting every single component by hand, one by one. Hmm. Can you imagine the process? And the pace at which for, at an industrial scale, that's going to be, that's a very hard thing to maintain. So it turns out that all that aside, there, there may be some good news and the Indian government may make an exception in Apple's case to allow these goods to flow a little more easily if they're going to end up in an iPhone. Mm -hmm. But it does bring up and continue the conversation around how these relations, the, the, the global situation around tech, how these parts have to cross borders and so much of it is still originating in China. And to what extent can, can this friction exist and, 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 and us or people in the Indian market continue to get the goods that they're looking for mm -hmm. at a price they want to pay and, and in a timely fashion and all the rest of it. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, but the tension continues, it would appear, between these two mega powerful nations and technology consumers. Hmm. Uh, on the same topic, Apple and Google have now, they've now entered the conversation as far as the blocking of software within India. So much like uh, the, the, the headline app, TikTok was getting all the press, as far as getting blocked, but now that number has expanded greatly on both the Apple App Store and on the Google Play Store. Between those two app stores, you're covering the entire landscape of smartphone users. Well, I don't know who, somebody hanging on to a Windows, somebody hanging on to a, I don't know what, a Blackberry? What's going on? No, it's, it's, it's gonna be iPhones and Android. And so now, you have dialogue between the Indian government and those two app stores to make the process of eliminating these apps, fully wiping them off the face of, of Earth or off the face of the Indian app store, at least. It, it makes it making it happen more efficiently. Mm. And so there was a thought at one point that, okay, how do you ban these apps? How do you really effectively ban these apps? So India was at first going directly to the uh, telcos the service providers in an attempt to block these apps. Of course, people will find other ways, VPNs, things like this. Then the next stage is we'll make it harder to get the app in the first place. Mm. And so get it off the app store. Now, you know, on the Android side, that's an easy thing to work around. You go grab the APK, install from unknown sources, no problemo. All right, they don't necessarily encourage it, but it's not the hardest thing. I don't, for the record, do that at your own risk, mm -hmm. for the record, because I'm sure there are some some absolutely uh, nefarious APKs out there on planet Earth, 2020. Mm -hmm. However, on the iOS side, a bit more difficult with the jailbreaking and so forth, I think customers are going to be far less likely to go for those that degree of workaround to get those apps. And then in cases of ByteDance, ByteDance went so far to just remove it themselves. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, fine, we see you, we hear you, we want to work towards changing that. ByteDance says we're going to follow whatever protocol you require for us to get back, and they think they're gonna make it back into the market. But Google and Apple complying for the time being with whatever it is that India wants to do, and uh, pre presumably India once again kind of aligning itself with those Western brands, right? as it, as it would be the case, as would be obvious here. And, and the brands themselves aligning themselves with whatever the Indian government wants to do. Google has discontinued the Pixel 3a and 3a XL. Those their budget lineup, budget models, as you're aware. Uh, this is newsworthy only because we haven't seen any kind of successor to the A series, which is uh, arguably the desirable series from Google right now. People looking for that budget model, looking for that value proposition. Uh, I played around with these two devices. Great cameras for the price, as, as you know. Uh, some changes were set to be made in the 4A model, which, uh, I mean, who knows what, what's going on with the 4A model. It was supposed to come out at Google I.O. In May? June? <sighs> Holy moly. And then you saw billboards in April. And then yeah. Google's like, I don't know, are we going to do it? What are we going to do? But in the meantime, this guy sells out, as you would expect. And so they discontinue it. They're not going to make any more, but on the official, their official sales channels it's over it's gone and you can only find them now on you know the third-party sellers the other retailers that may still have them in stock so you have no budget 
Google availability for you now as a potential buyer until this 4, 4A thing gets sorted out. The rumored 4A, just a quick reminder, set to be a 5.8 inch display, 2340 by 1080, mid range Snapdragon 730. It'll have a 12.12 .12 megapixel rear camera, 8 megapixel front camera. This is all based on rumors, but so much information has leaked about the thing. And a more modern design, obviously, to meet with the current criteria. Price points have been rumored, but I think the world is ready for this 4A, and I think Google better get to it, especially in the absence of the 3A being available anymore. Speaking of Google, they are sending... Boatloads of cash. I love this article because he used the word boatloads. And uh, that doesn't mean he's a fan of Lou later. It just means he's uh, got a great taste in language. Mm. Boatload is big, Willie Do. You and I, we've been over it. We don't need to cover it again. Mm. However, this is a, a lesser known thing. I mean, I'm sure certain people in the audience are aware of this, but not everybody. Google sends tremendous cash to Apple to remain as the default search engine when a person cracks into Safari. You know, you, you launch Safari, you see Google. Well, that seems odd when you think about it. You're so used to it now, but it seems odd when you think about it. They're the number one competitor, mm -hmm. ultimately. The, their OS is the competition to iOS, yet you launch into the search engine, you see a big Google logo even on iOS. Mm. Now, for the record, I don't see in my world, in my life, a valid competitor to Google. Google is like a a human utility at this point. It would be hard to exist and survive and do a lot of the things that we do in the absence of Google. And it's not just the search engine. We use all the Gmail products and and we use the Google Drive. And it's like, holy, you, you, the brand is such a utility, Google Maps, in so many places that you forget. You don't even see the logo anymore. Mm -hmm. You just think of it like turning on the tap. Mm -hmm. And so in the case of Apple, that... Uh, a utility or automatic thing is actually paid for. That automatic moment of launching Safari and Google is paid for. And it's paid for to the tune of possibly, maybe, this is not public numbers, $12 billion. Now, this particular article only cites this, this what came out in the UK, which was $1.5 billion. And it's because there's some kind of uh, a monumental situation going on there where they're examining the business practices of Google and the fact that there, there might not be real competition for them in the search segment. And of course that would be the case if it was going to cost you billions of dollars to get onto the biggest OS or the two biggest OSs, right? You're not, you're not going to become the, the search engine for people's choice on, on, on Android. Mm -hmm. Obviously, iOS might be the only other place you got a shot. But in that case, they're paying billions. And as presumably as an upstart or a competitor, you don't got the billions. No. So anyway, it's just a curious thing to sort of highlight for those that may be less aware that even these brands that appear to be competitive and are competitive have these strange inner workings that actually affect your experience. And I think a lot of people, whether you're a fan of Android or a fan of iOS, can pretty much admit Google's got it when it comes to search and you wouldn't want to use an iPhone for the most part that defaulted to something else. And so that begs the question for me, what is the right dollar figure? Because I understand it's very powerful for Google to be on that mega iOS platform. But what do they do if Google says, I'm done with the cash, I, I, I'm sick of paying? Do they, what do they put? Bing? I don't know what they even put. Duck, duck, go. Duck, duck, go. Can you imagine that as the official brand on an iPhone when you launch Safari? That seems like an impossible future to imagine. It, of course it could happen. It's not impossible, but it just seems hard to believe. Yeah. But as I mentioned, the same could be said for some of these other Google applications that just are so commonplace now in the world in 2020. But anyway, you could check out the article if you want to see more specifics. And if you know of a true competitor search engine that you think offers exactly what Google offers or even beyond, I want to see those suggestions down in the comments. I'm curious. PlayStation has suspended their advertising on Facebook, joining a number of other brands that are doing the same thing. It's some sort of Facebook advertising boycott. There's a hashtag around it. You know how that goes, Will. Once you put a hashtag on it, the brands, they just bounce. Some sort of boycott, hashtag, the brands, they bounce. They don't want to be accused of anything. They're trying to get you to buy something. Mm -hmm. They want to be loved universally by everyone. Well, there's a hashtag, stop hate for profit. There's a feeling 
there's a group. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not I'm not heavy into the into the uh, um, background around this particular hashtag. But the rough idea is that this group feels Facebook is not doing enough to counter hate on the platform. They feel that Twitter and Twitch most recently, they feel they some of these brands uh, are answering to the request of users mm -hmm. where users are saying we want these actions to take place. And then if the actions don't take place, the, they, they put pressure on the brand to bounce. You've mm -hmm. seen it happen. Mm -hmm. Some brands are getting ahead of it. Some brands are in agreement with it. Others may be less so. This list now includes Coca-Cola, Honda, Unilever, Ford, Starbucks, Microsoft, and you can add PlayStation to that list that are bouncing off Facebook. you got to believe at some point, this is Facebook is going to get upset at some point. Mm -hmm. you got to believe. This, oh, yeah. is, this is dollars, Will. You can count this. You can put this in a spreadsheet. Yeah. The investors eventually look at it and say, what's going on here? What happened to the ad revenue? PlayStation said in a statement, in support of the hashtag Stop Hate for Profit campaign, we have globally suspended our Facebook and Instagram activity. Don't you forget Instagram, Facebook product, including advertising and non-paid content. Think about that. They're not going to be posting on either of those platforms to promote their upcoming uh, PS5. That's a big deal. Oh, yeah. But over here, they say until the end of July, we stand for working and playing together for good. I think this is a tough campaign. I mean, how do you get rid of hate? It's so vague. It's so huge. Hate. I can't hit any of these social media platforms without feeling it. No. Now, I understand you want to do something. You want to have some process for, for uh, attacking things that are happening on your platform that may be influencing people's experiences. But more importantly, will the dollars... Money talks, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, these, these, these uh, platforms cease to exist if the advertisers bounce. Mm -hmm. So if the pressure keeps getting applied to the advertiser, it makes its way back regardless of your philosophical uh, ideology, wherever you land on the thing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, PlayStation is joining that group at least until the end of July. Maybe they come rushing back uh, with the PS5 ads. <laughs> When they got to sell a few things and they need those users. I don't know. We'll see. We have a strange twist in a doctor disrespect case. And I've been looking very closely at these headlines, trying to figure out if any new information emerges. It's all the it's, same. It's all the same. Oh. We know nothing. So anyways, that's the reason this one caught my attention. It's not exactly the same. It's still we know nothing, but it's more we know nothing Okay. in a particular uh, region where I wouldn't have expected to see it. So this story, it's via svg.com, notes that not only did Dr. Disrespect evaporate off of Twitch, but he evaporated somewhere else, somewhere very strange. He evaporated off of the GIF service Giphy. Are you familiar with it? I think there's GIFs of me on Giphy. Yes. And probably, maybe even you. Maybe after this. Oh, yeah. Somebody put Willie Do saying yeah on, on to Giphy, just nodding. Just nod. Yes. It, I would love it. I use that GIF every day. I put it in, our, in a Slack, and we could use it in here. It would be an incredible utility. We need it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Giphy seemingly no direct connection to Twitch. Uh, we have no reason to believe that they know anything we don't know. Yet, in a moment's notice... All of a sudden, every disrespect GIF, it's just a GIF. How offensive can a GIF be? Evaporates off the service. Now, they did a little bit more investigation. They realized GIFs that aren't disrespect, but people that look like or are dressed up as disrespect, those GIFs are okay. Uh -huh. And you can find them with the Dr. Disrespect search term. So there's a manual person just looking at whether it's a real disrespect or... Like a fake one. To, well, to figure out, yeah, or, 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 yeah, how? How, Will? I don't know. Yeah. It's crazy. But so, but somebody high up in there, and, and you got to assume they have to have some process for filtering gifts. That, there could be really offensive gifts. Yeah. I mean, that wouldn't be too hard to do. So there's somebody there, but that kind of direct missile-like targeting, oh, my goodness, now you're, now you're, do they know something? Did the, is there somebody inside of Twitch that knows more, that knows somebody at Giphy, makes a phone call, sends an email, nobody makes a phone call, sends a message, 
you want to take that down right now before this next thing breaks. Mm -hmm. You want to get that out of there right now. So I would say this particular development, as weird and little as it is, not looking good. Not yeah. Now, maybe it's nothing. To be clear, maybe it's nothing. Maybe they're just being preemptive. They're like, I don't know. He's off Twitch. We're going to take it down. Anything can happen. But it just seems a little too targeted for me. That's my opinion. And we're going to we're gonna keep an eye on it. It's still big big news, and the internet's still waiting. And the internet don't like to wait. Mm -hmm. Will he do? A little follow-up here on the 2021 Ford F-150. Covered it a little bit on the show. Uh, some interesting stuff, some interesting tech inside. Here, here we have a little Easter egg. Look at that photo, Will. I'm going to give you a little quick challenge here. Where is the Easter egg in this particular photo? There's an Easter egg on the dash. And it's a little nod. It's a I'm, well. It says in the headline, it's a patriotic nod, a patriotic Easter egg. Can you spot it? I have to admit, I did not see it right away. Um, no, I, I don't see it. Okay, take a look next to the air vent, and you see those lines, that series of lines, stripes. Oh, oh stripes. That's the American flag flipped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they did it in such a way that it doesn't strike you immediately because it is flipped. I think if it was the other direction, it would be noticeable. But they just kind of hit it. They meshed it. They melded it in there. Mm. And uh, for those that notice it, I guess it gives them a little, uh, I don't know, a patriotic feeling. I bought an American car. I'm not really sure. But uh, it's kind of cool when a designer can put a, uh, a signature touch on something. It's backwards, though. But I think it's, you think that's offensive that it's backwards. It might be, yeah. Well, that's interesting. I that's mean, an interesting take. I like the fact that it's backwards. It's cool. Because it's less in your face. It's like, you know it's there. Yeah. You, it's what makes it an Easter egg. I think if it was flipped the other way, it would be so obvious that you wouldn't perceive it as an Easter egg. Mm. But I don't know. Of course, uh, that's, up to, that's up to anybody's interpretation there. Tipping its cap to the country in which it's built and presumably only visible when the door is open. See, that's also covered when the door is closed. Right. Ford stamped the 13 stripes of the American flag onto the side of the metal trim that wraps around the air vents. Now, we're getting all kinds of information emerging about the vehicle, uh, inside stuff, uh, cabin refinements that are really interesting to me from a utilitarian perspective. It looks like they paid a lot of attention to this vehicle specifically, as you would if you were Ford, because of the fact this is a big seller. Number one vehicle will. You do a new F-150, you better do it right. Mm -hmm. And so I think... Ford as a company, really, this is the flagship vehicle at this point. And so that, that gives you an idea of the attention to detail. Now, staying on the topic of the new F-150, this individual on YouTube, his name is Cleaner Watt. He did this comprehensive comparison video, Cybertruck versus the new F-150. And then that was covered on InsideEVs.com. I watched the 22-minute video because hmm. it seems like such a curious comparison, such a strange comparison the two th the two things when you place them beside each other i know they're both trucks but my goodness are they different looking things and of course they're different in behavior as well because one of them's an ev and the the most electrified version of the f-150 you can do right now in 2021 model year is a hybrid model so it's going to be more fuel efficient but it's still got some combustion going on mm. so anyway he does this exhaustive comparison 22 minute comparison and actually some of the coolest stuff is in the cabin for me on the new f-150 including this lockable storage that you just showcased and if you back this up a tiny bit another cool thing i like is right here just a little bit more back up will because i want you to see how the thing folds out yeah look so the gear shifter goes down and you get a desk in the middle of the car now a lot of people work out of their trucks and this is this that's a game changer right there to get a desk, a, a true flat surface across the entire uh, middle center console section. Yeah. Now you place a laptop on top. Will you're you're editing videos? You're imagine a guy like you. You're on the go. I would think this would be a good like eating table. Good. Uh, yeah, you there know? you go. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in the trades and a lot of construction workers. There, you got to eat some lunch in the. Tr well, even you got to eat lunch in the car every of so course. often. Every day. And so maybe the uh, the food reviewers on YouTube, uh, they got a nice desk now. Yes. 
if yes. they pick this up. So get this nice flat surface. There's all kinds of cabin refinements. Another one I love, Will, and maybe you can find the spot in here. Yes, it's next up. It's right there. The seats recline fully down in a truck. Look at this. Now I can speak from experience. You can't find this. So it becomes a bed. A bed. Oh. It goes completely That's flat, cool. the seats. So you could take a nap. And again, if you're working out of your truck, that could be huge. That quick nap when you need it. Oh, yeah. My goodness. And then, of course, I also talked about the upgrades to the uh, infotainment, to the tech. One of the advantages that this is still going to have over the Tesla, and I don't know how much it depends on how you view this, but it'll have Android Auto and uh, and CarPlay, Apple CarPlay. So for whatever reason, Tesla's against that idea. Maybe they'll add it eventually, but they have their own infotainment stuff that they're pushing. They got their own games and all the rest of it. But this comparison... Here's what happens. I watched a 22-minute comparison, and you know what, what, what comes out of it for me? Is, holy moly, that Cybertruck is a good value because they have to spec up the F-150 2021 like crazy to have it have just the same features that this one's going to have with all the safety features and all the rest of it. And he goes over the uh, towing capacity, over the payload that you can put in the bed, the bed size, all kinds of truck stuff. And it really makes the Cybertruck look like a decent value for money at the current asking price. Now, I know it's not a real thing. It's not in the world yet. You can pre-order it. God knows when people are actually going to get it. And it looks a crazy way. And it's electric, which it remains to be seen how practical that is for a real work environment. You know, Will, I'll see, you'll see work trucks on the side of the road. They, they, they're not going to be able to make it to a charger every single night or they're 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 kept at the back of a of a lot of a parking lot the idea of a true utility vehicle or a work vehicle being electric only remains to be seen things are going to have to change in how easy it is to to get the thing powered back up mm -hmm. so there's some questions there where you're going to really have to shift the mindset for the the truck working type however this brought up a question for me about the what might have happened? The what if? If Tesla just had have put out a true F-150 competitor that looked like a truck. Right. With all these enhancements, with the payload and the towing, and I know there's tons of questions around the towing, to be clear, how that will affect range on an electric motor and all the rest of it. Would it have sold better if it wasn't such an extreme design? Now, I know it was a huge hit. It was a meme. Tons of people watching it. And I certainly don't want that to be the case. I love to look at things. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think the average buyer is as crazy as me or you. Maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. But that working type, that construction type, all the trucks you see in those work environments, are all those people ready to switch over? Even if you can showcase to them the value for money and the actual truck specs, can they really pull up to the job site in this thing? No. Probably not. Not yet. Probably not. So I am sitting here all kinds of respect for the fact that you go so outlandish on your design in the face of all the pressure that you and I could perceive coming at you saying, man, if you can deliver these truck specs in something that resembles an F-150, you could be the number one car on the road, period. Mm -hmm. That's what they're up against. And, and still they said, nah, let's have some fun. Right. So I love it. But I, I get real curious watching this comparison video over whether or not from a strict short-term business perspective if it was the right move or not. Because it would seem hard to launch a traditional truck and this truck at the same time. You couldn't do both. Yeah. And he took he took the edgy route. You got to change the whole industry to get people comfy with it. But then there's uh, you know, Rivian and Rivian. Nikola. They have trucks R that look like the 150. R Rivian is going to be a real question mark. If Rivian goes on to put a real foot to, to Ford and the F-150 sales, then Tesla's going to have to think long and hard. Mm -hmm. And, or even if, I mean, that's a good looking truck, man. It is, yeah. I'll tell you what, that photo you have right there, that Rivian truck, for me, it's a toss up which one I even like the look of more compared to the Cybertruck. I don't own either of them yet, but there's something nice and subtle about the futuristic aspect of the Rivian. I think... That might be a concept photo because it, it kind of toned it down a little. Yeah, it's a little toned down. But anyways, uh, I'm glad the Cybertruck exists. Don't get me wrong here, Will. 
I love the fact that there's an option like that exists in the world. I love that people's imaginations make it into real physical things that are crazy. I'm not trying to take a step back on it. I'm just saying it's a tough business move. And I'm real curious to see how it plays out, especially after seeing this strange comparison. But you're right. Rivian does exist as that third option. And we'll see how it all... Maybe that's why they did it. Because Rivian had their stuff ready to go and was close. Yeah. And maybe they said, we can't just do another uh, Rivian clone or something. Yeah. We want to just blow it out. We want to just make the whole world know about electric vehicles. So you got to, hey, man, two sides to it, two ways to play it. I'm sure if we had Elon sitting right here, he'd say, look, I can't, you know, you got to consider it. Yeah. I'm sure if he was sitting right there. Uh, stick it, sticking with Tesla for one more. Our, uh, yesterday's, epi- yesterday's headline topic was the, the uh, Tesla becoming the most valuable automaker in terms of market cap. A lot of people came back and said, market cap? That's not it. What about actual units moved? The stock market's crazy. They don't know what they're doing. It's all hype. That's what people were, were, ta- were talking about. And they're, they're right. I, I thought I uh, gave a nod to that in a, particular, in a particular episode that, hey, man, the stock market is one thing. Units on the road is another thing. And they are different things. However, stock market is money. That's a real figure. That's real dollars. It's real. It's still a real thing. It's not everything, but it is a thing. Well, anyways, today they took our story from yesterday and they blew it out even further. They came with some numbers and said they delivered 90,000 vehicles in the second quarter. And they showed off that they were uh, a little bit more immune to the problems happening in the world right now, whatever economic fears exist, because their sales dip over, over the same period from last year was far more minor than the other big automakers. Other big automakers took a much bigger dive. They appeared to be sort of, uh, what, would you, what would you say, uh, catastrophe-proof. A little bit more. No, nobody's fully catastrophe-proof, but a little bit more than some of those other players. So they surpassed the Wall Street expectations, which uh, they were guessing that Tesla in the same period would be able to deliver around 72,000 units. They come with 90,650. And then the investors come in even harder. And now we hit some peak price today, $1,219 pre-market trading. Holy moly, people are still hype on Tesla. And look at the climb. What do you have? You have the one year there. We don't even need the one year. Give us the, the one month. I mean, look at the one month. Just climbing. Just climbing, ladies and gentlemen. So, yes, the stock market is crazy. I agree with you. I don't know what we can derive from it, but people are hype on Tesla when it comes to the long-term future, and they think they can make money. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. They think they can make money. They think there's more hype behind this hype. Yeah. And, of course, Tesla is shipping vehicles, so they're... They're getting closer to figuring out the actual fulfillment. Of course, the core of those 90,000 plus deliveries, Model Y, the new Model Y, and of course, a Model 3. The other two, almost nobody's buying them, just to be clear. Really? The older models, the X and the S, only accounted for 10,000 of those units. Oh, wow. So those things need an update badly and possibly a lower price point. Or if they want to keep them luxury, then they need an update. If they want to keep them at that price point, because it's all the... Uh, lower tier but of course that's expected at any automaker Mm -hmm. that your uh, entry level stuff is going to be your popular stuff so model three model y this last story for me will is just i just it's just an attempt to put things in perspective for those of us that feel a certain way on a daily basis that feel our problems are are uh, larger than life that feel that the human problems of the of the world are the be all and end all of existence you go to this site for perspective yes come here for perspective Scientists, uh, astronomers have discovered, astronomers are scientists, aren't they? They discovered a black hole, an enormous black hole. How about a black hole 34 billion times the mass of our sun? 34 billion times the mass of our sun. That thing that you look at in the sky that powers everything. Good. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you know about what black holes really do. They uh, gobble things up. And this one is gobbling at a fairly rapid pace. It's a hungry black hole. This one is gorging nearly the equivalent of one sun every day. <laughs> that black hole's eating a sun every day. It's For, a uh, that's just a tasty breakfast. meal. Yeah, it's just breakfast. Yeah. Just eating a sun every day. And we're over here bickering with one another on planet Earth. You said what? No, you did. No, I hate you. 
No, you're dead. You're canceled. Get out of my face. Black holes off in the distance over there just gobbling a, a sun a day. Yeah. It's such a crazy concept to wrap your head around. We're sitting here floating. It's also incredibly amazing. We're driving around electric vehicles. Uh, black holes are up there eating things. And it's the stuff that we choose to uh, bicker about is kind of yeah. wild. This is apparently an old thing, as it would have to be. And we're seeing it at a time when the universe was only 1.2 billion years old, less than 10% of its current age. It's the biggest black hole that's been weighed in this period of the universe. Does it have a name? Do they give names to black holes? That's what I was wondering. I actually don't see a name to it. If the Milky Way's black hole wanted to grow to the size of this one, it would have to swallow two-thirds of all the stars in our galaxy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. The team, including researchers from the University of Arizona, used ESO's very large telescope in Chile to accurately measure the black hole's mass. With such an enormous black hole, we're also excited to see what we can learn about the galaxy in which it's growing. Is the galaxy one of the behemoths of the early universe, or did the black hole just swallow up an extraordinary amount of its surroundings? We will have to keep digging in order to figure that out. So anyway, Will, I don't know about you. Some people look at something like this and they have a feeling of terror. They think, my goodness, getting gobbled up by a black hole. Who knows how this whole thing ends? seeing stuff like this, but I actually, it's a weight off my shoulders when I read something like this. Mm. It makes me do the thing that I started the topic with. It makes me think about how small, how small we are, how small our problems truly are, and how when we think about trying to overcome complicated things in the scope of complicated things, they're still barely complicated, mm -hmm. our complicated things, because you have black holes out there eating suns for breakfast.